Hello, everyone, and welcome to Fearlessly Authentic. I'm your host, Jody Harrison Bauer, and I am so excited to have you join me today. If you are a first time listener, welcome to the show. This is the place where we educate you, empower you with that knowledge, entertain you a bit, and inspire you to live your most fearlessly authentic life. Because, in my opinion, if we're not doing that, what the heck are we doing here? And today's guest is going to show you his fearlessly authentic life. My guest today is Andy Sarkini, who survived the Holocaust. He grew up in Hungary, born in 1936, and he is going to take us through what it was like living there as a young boy and um, with Hitler, um, Germany, Nazi Germany, and everything that he saw as a young boy. And we um, we relate to a lot of things going on in the world right now. There are no politics involved here. This is just education and empowering you with it. Because I thought, given the times that we are in right now, it is so important that we are educated. I have so many friends that ask me questions and I don't always have the answers. And so this is not a political thing. This is um, this is history, and Andy's going to educate us here. And some of the things he's going to be talking about are heartbreaking, um, but I think it's important to hear from the people that were actually living during these times. And Andy is eighty-seven years old, and he can run circles <laughs> around me. Um, he's been speaking for over a decade educating young people all over the country, traveling to Israel, Poland. And uh, he's going to share he's going to share his journey with you. But I wanted to give you some background on Andy. Andy Sarkani, born in Budapest in 1936, endured the Holocaust in the city's ghetto where he resided in a building hosting a nursery linked to the Jewish Agency of Hungary. Led by Mr. Eugene Polnay, the school, situated in the same building as a dance studio, played a crucial role in Andy's survival and that of around 150 orphan children. Despite his father's internment in Mauthausen concentration camp during 1944, he managed to survive. Following World War II, Hungary transitioned into communism, leading to Andy being labeled as an undesirable element due to his pre-communist business ownership, resulting in his university rejection in 1955. Fortunately, Andy escaped Hungary after the 1956 uprising, immigrating to the United States. There he learned his bachelor's degree from Tusculoma College and a master's of science degree in applied mathematics and computer science from Washington University. Andy subsequently worked for McDonnell Douglas Corporation and IBM. Over the last decade, he has shared his firsthand experiences of the Holocaust, Soviet rule in Hungary, and his journey to the United States with students. Currently married to his wife of over 50 years, they have a daughter, son, and five grandchildren. Andy Sarkhani's life embodies resilience and adaptation across tumultuous historical periods. Welcome to the show, Andy. Hi, Andy, and welcome to the show. All right, thank you very much. It is a very important topic you would like to cover because it re referred to every in our everyday life. So what we want to talk about today is you growing up in Hungary. You were born and you just had... Well, I was born in Budapest, Hungary in uh, October 31st of 1936. So... You are newly 87. 87, yes. Go ahead. And I, I am a very young Holocaust survivor, referred to it as a Holocaust child survivor. So you are on the young side. Yes, very much so. And there aren't many left. No, unfortunately, people who are in the position to able to give talks are very few because most of the Holocaust survivors who are alive, they are over 90 and uh, not necessarily good shape. So what I wanted to point out, and you said it already, but I want to make sure the listeners hear it, is that you are a child 
of surviving the Holocaust, but you were not in the Holocaust. I want to just be clear about I, that. Okay. I am a child Holocaust survivor who survived the Budapest ghetto. Uh, my mother was there too, but my father was deported to concentration camp. So why don't you take us back? Okay. So let's start with Hitler took power in 1933. Okay. And Jewish life almost immediately deteriorated. So Hitler had a philosophy of creating a superior race. I call him racial purification. It's called the Aryan race. So beside the Jews, Can many- I Could I interrupt you again? Is that going to- Sure. Okay. So when you say Aryan race, as a Jewish woman, I've heard that before, but a lot of people listening at home may not understand what that was. What Hitler was looking for. He, he was looking to- He was exterminate. trying to- to me, to purify Germany and the whole world. And there were groups of people, according to his definition or his philosophy, to eliminate people. And the major target was the Jews. But beside the Jews, there were people like the Slovaks, the Blacks, Jehovah Witnesses, the Handicaps, and the Gypsies, or sometimes we refer them to Romans. So beside the Jews, there were millions of other people who were targeted for elimination. So that was what referred to an alienation, getting rid of the people whom he felt is not contributing to his philosophy. So when you talked about these people, are they were they the elderly? Were they the very young? To them, to Hitler and, and the fascist government didn't differentiate between a child Okay. Or very elderly. Okay. And in the concentration camps, there were babies as well as people who barely could walk. I did not know there okay. were babies. Yes. Any anybody who they designated being a Jew and they were deported, it made no difference. So when they were taken to concentration camps, they were very much separated the children from the mother or father, the woman and men were separated, and they dealt with the, the fascist government uh, personalities, dated them just worse than an animal. I don't think people, I mean, you can see I'm getting very emotional right now. Um, it's just when you think as a mother and you think about I can't even imagine having my babies taken away from me. And babies are like the purest form of human beings ever. And um, I just... It, it was very unfortunate, okay, uh, for, for anyone to see that practically a child of one or two or three years old were practically taken from the mother's hand and practically destroyed like just have no meaning in life. And that's how basically Hitler viewed that. Right. So one of, in your presentation, um, Andy has spoken to a, a countless schools. How many, I mean, well, you've been speaking about I, this I for usually a long time. speak in a public school, public libraries, churches, uh, as many as 60, 70 uh, events are, are, are an academic year, and uh, uh, my audience is ranging from anywhere from fifth graders to elderly people. And given, see, I told you we were going to bounce around here. So thanks for going with the flow. This is the youngest 87 year old I've ever met in my life. I I aspire to be like you. Um, you. <laughs> um, but one of You've been talking about this for years and years, but given what happened on October 7th, are there more and more people like myself who are reaching out to you to help educate people? Because that is the main focus of today is to talk about your your courage, but to also talk about and educate us to feel empowered with the information from you so we can be more educated about what's going on right now. October 7th was a day of unbelievable pain and agony. I was in a synagogue because it's a Jewish holiday when it was called Simhas Torah. 
And the rabbi made an announcement and nobody could believe what he was saying. And when I went home uh, to my son's apartment, the phone was ringing and we knew that our granddaughter happened to be, was in Jerusalem at the time. So we worried about her conditions. Thanks God, she's okay. And uh, I couldn't believe some of the pictures which I have seen on various TV stations. It reminded me as a child, going back to 1943, 1944, what happened in Budapest, Hungary. And it was devastating. So when we say never again as Jews, it just happened again in October and we cannot tolerate it. And unfortunately, a group of people in age group from let's say 18 to 40, they just do not understand about Jewish life, Judaism, about Israel, they get all confused and being politically correct, they just not doing the right thing. And to me, the color is black, it's not gray, it's not white or any shades, it is black. And we need to call it out. And clearly what's happening in Israel today, we cannot afford in our world society to have a barbaric group of people like a Hamas who are trying to rule and eliminate a nation. There is a saying goes, then river to the sea. I don't know exactly the quotation, but it says that from Palestine the river to sea, Palestine will be free. It's the elimination of a legitimate country called Israel. It's Nothing particular to the Jews, but the country. And we can, have no choice but to doing something about it. Can you explain that the state or the country of Israel, I refer to it as the state of Israel, um, which has only been around since 1948, um, that there are not just Jews. That is where m most of the Jewish people live in the world. That is the biggest concentration of Jewish people. But in Israel, it's just not Jewish people. There are, explain, who well, else lives uh, there? There are many Christians live there, particularly in the J Jerusalem area. Uh, and it, it, Muslims live there. And the, the political situation is, not what I am dealing with, but right. the people peacefully able to get along in as much as there is a lot of political conflict existing. But it's not only Jews. And uh, uh, and I think the misconception is there are Palestinians living there are, in... And they're, they're not only really Palestinians live there, but Palestinians are coming in right. to being part of the Israeli workforce. Uh, for year in and year out. And I thank you for clarifying that. Let's go back to what we were talking about before. I wanted to give just some reference as to what happened then, what's going on now, and continuing to educate um, our listeners here. So Hitler takes over. He wants to exterminate all the Jews. Where are you? How old are you? Well, in 1944, I was not quite eight years old. But actually, my concept of anti-Semitism, really, I learned it when I was seven. And why it's seven? Because the building I lived in uh, was actually became an orphanage. And there were 150 children were there oh, from middle of 1943 through beginning of 1944. But in 1943, I went to first grade. And the school was only a couple of blocks away where I lived. And my mother enrolled me and took me to school. And after a couple of weeks, she said, Andy, you can go to the school on your own. So I was a very proud little boy with a backpack, all dressed up, walked to school. I just mentioned to you two blocks, two blocks away. On my way to school, People pushed me to the pavement, spit on me, called me a dirty Jew, called me all kinds of other derogatory names. They said, Jews will not replace us. They are bloodsuckers. I didn't know what it meant. 
And so after a few weeks going to school on my own, I told my mother, I cannot go to school any longer. Because my mother asked me why your face is bruised. And I had a hard time to explaining what happened. So anti-Semitism hit me and a hatred of Jews hit me in September of 1943. So it was a devastating feeling. And unfortunately, I had really no father because he was taken to forced labor camp uh, from 1941. That the forced labor camp, and I know when we spoke, you explained this to me, the forced um, labor camps, how were they different than the Holocaust camps? Okay, a forced labor camp basically were locally oriented within the country. Jews were taken to various places to do work for the government or a military, wherever it was involved. So my father was taken away and obviously they were not getting any paid. They barely got food. The housing was dismal and many, many people actually died in forced labor camps. Uh, every now and then they were released, go home because the work what they were performing was completed. But it was basically a local activities to trying to demonize and weaken the Jewish people. Concentration camps when actually people were taken by either train or other means of transportation to a camp where they were practically stripped all of the identity and they made them to work uh, for whatever institution uh, they were facing with, either in Germany or in Poland or in Hungary or, or in Romania or, or whatever uh, Eastern European countries. So the difference was they were stripped of their identity in the Holocaust camps, but in the the what your dad was doing, the labor camps, after his work was completed, which he didn't get paid for, right? Yes. Um, after, how long was he in there? Were well, people there for months or he, could they he, ever come home? My father, barely I remember, when he was gone for months. And that was off and on because they said then a Hungarian nation uh, signed up the mission of Hitler, Nazi uh, government. And so there was a relationship between the two countries. And so the Hungarian military was actually supporting and be part of the Nazi operation. So my father was working, obviously, I mentioned to you, no pay, and 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 in devastating conditions in Hungary. Periodically, when the job was completed, they would release them and then they come and get them again. And they didn't particularly differentiate it between men or women. If they found uh, a woman to able to do any kind of work, they took them away too. Okay, so you're in Hungary. This is going on in the countries that you mentioned. Is what countries are trying to help you? Are there any countries coming in and trying to get rid of Hitler? That, Where's the U.S.? There was, you see, related to particularly with Hungary, there was nothing. It was the, the Nazis were practically there. See, the relationship between Hungary and, and Nazi Germany were very close because Hitler trusted the Hungarian leader, Miklos Horthy. And actually, Hungary was occupied by the Nazis in March of 1944. And until then, things were very much uh, very liquid with the Hungarian government related to the general population. And uh, uh, Hungary had approximately 650,000 Jews who lived there. The majority of them lived in in Budapest, in the periphery of Budapest, okay? And uh, my father was actually permanently taken to a concentration camp in January of 1944. So Hitler becomes the Chancellor of Germany in 33, but they don't, in when do they invade Hungary? Well, by 1938, there were already concentration camps were built 
all over in Germany and also in Poland. And Poland Hungary, was one of the well, Poland was the major uh, killing place for the Nazis. Okay, beside Auschwitz, Birkenau, there were many other uh, locations like Majdanek, Treblinka, Sovibor, and and other places where Jews were deported and slaughtered, slaughtered worse than an animal. But in, hung in Hungary, it was a little bit different because the relationship between the two countries and the Hungarian Jews were deported in mid-1944. After the Nazi occupation of Hungary, uh, Adolf Eichmann was sent by the Nazis to Hungary oh, to, okay. uh, to expedite the deportation of the Hungarian Jews. Mm -hmm. Prior to that point, Jews who were deported, most of them ended up on the west of Hungary, majority of them in Austria and in Germany. After the occupation, but uh, Eichmann came, about 550,000 Hungarian Jews were transported, uh, deported to uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau. I'd just like to tell you that Auschwitz-Birkenau is two villages, is about two miles apart. And the surface area, you wouldn't believe how big it is. I was there last April to learn in first hand and seeing the historical uh, remnants of the camps. So, and you want to describe that a little bit? Well, in both camps, there were close to a dozen gas chambers with crematoriums existed. And Jews were, number one, when they arrived, they were immediately separated, men and women. And but they didn't know where they were going, right? They they didn't. When they were taken from their homes uh, and taken eventually to a railroad station and shipped them, they had no idea where they will end up. And they actually didn't know where they were when the train arrived three, four days later. Okay. It happened to be there was auschwitz Birkenau slaughtered over 1.2 million Jews. And some of them were children close to uh, about uh, a quarter million of them. And then and the men and women were separated and they put them to work. They were in barracks, which was unbelievable uh, uh, conditions. Uh, it was cold uh, and, and they barely got uh, food, maybe about eight, 900 calories a day. So they were slowly starved the people and they made them to do purely slave labor, meaningless work. And eventually uh, they were taken to the gas chambers uh, and, and, and slaughtered that way. Uh, particularly in, in a village of Treblinka that was exclusively called a death camp. And there was no barracks there. The Germans created an artificial railroad station where the trains came in, the I call a cattle car, some people refer to it as a freight car. The Jews were crammed in there like sardines. When the doors opened, they were went through the selection, and within about an hour, hour and a half later, they were ashes. They were gas chambers, they were gassed, and uh, there was mass. Uh, the graves uh, and that camp exclusively uh, was that purpose. And that camp also uh, slaughtered uh, close to a million Jews. So is it mind blowing to you that people say the Holocaust never happened? Well, you know, I grew up as a teenager and went to high school under the communistic system in Budapest, the Soviet brutality. And I remember very clearly that the Soviets falsified history for the benefit of the communistic beliefs, because my mother was a very good teacher. 
And every time when I studied history and literature and uh, non-science activities, she listened how I learned the lessons. And then she said to me, when, when I went to high school, it was a different thing. So I understood the people falsifying and denying what really happened. And unfortunately, too many people fully believed the Nazi fascist philosophy. And obviously, they deny that a Holocaust ever happened. And there is a movie taught, called The Denial. And you should really see it, how uh, individual will falsify for his own personal gain and benefit that a Holocaust never happened. And it's all over, all over today in the United States. Right. I, 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 there were students who walked up to me after when I give a talk, he says, well, what you are telling me is not true wow. because it never happened. Wow. And clearly they learned that one from their parents, their parents right. or grandparents. Right. Right. Okay. So do you think that's what's happening now with everybody? Do you want to grab some water? Um, do you believe that that's what's happening now? You mentioned this at the beginning of the show that there are a lot of uneducated people. And our goal today is to educate everybody who's listening is that the lack of education, understanding history correctly um, is what needs to happen right now, which is why we need you to speak out. We need to learn from you. When you are looking at college campuses, mm -hmm. and I don't want to name any particular one, but it was all over in, in the news within the last couple of weeks. The anti-Jewish sentiment, namely anti-Semitism, and it is really a very kind word because I call them hating the Jews. And that's what really happening. And they really don't understand what it's all about. Uh, we are li living in a difficult times where war is happening all over. Not only now in the Middle East, but you look at it in Ukraine, and just look at it what happened in Syria over the years. Nobody complained about the hundreds of thousands of Syrians who were slaughtered by Assad. But if something the Jews do, they immediately jump on them. And really, on the whole world, there are about 14, 14 million Jews live. They just pick on it because they need to have the anger against something or somebody. And unfortunately, over the decades and, and centuries, the Jews were always the target. So when this was happening, you're, it's 1944, you're eight years old, right? Eight, nine years old. And then you, you stay there until you're 20. But what is your life like? You go to school. Um, what is it life like at home? What is life like every day for you? Are that, you and why weren't, and did you fear every day that you were going to be sent to a, a Holocaust camp or your mother that, or siblings? Well, when I was that young, the Budapest situation was different than the rest of the European conditions right. because of a political relationship between Hungary and Germany. But when the Nazis occupied Hungary, things changed and the, the Hungarian Jews were rounded up. Practically people went to building to building and took the Jews away. But I lived in a a seventh district of the city of Budapest, and that was very heavily populated by Jews. And they left the seventh district sort of alone because they knew that they will eventually be able to come in and practically take everybody away from that particular district and ship them to some concentration camps. So the Budapest ghetto was open uh, in end of August, beginning of September of 1944. And Hungary was when the, the ghetto was actually liberated in January of 1940, uh, <clears throat> January 1945. The ghetto was an isolated area of about 74 acres in size. <clears throat> and there were over 80,000 Jews who were cramped in there by law. 
the law stated that every Jew in the city of Budapest must move into that small territory. Wow. And the building where I lived, uh, we were very fortunate because it, it used to be part of a, a kindergarten nursery school. And we children were forced to being, I call him a dungeon, is like a cellar, but nothing like what you would think about a cellar is. We were fed one meal a day. We were taking care of the people who were residents of the building. The conditions there was really terrible. We had one light bulb. We lived in a city, so there was when it was electricity, we had light. And if we had water in, in a city, then we had water. Uh, and uh, there was almost no ventilation. And we were told then we keep our mouth shut all the time. Why? Because the Hungarian Nazis, the members of the Arrow Cross Party, were continuously coming into the building and was harassing all the adults whom they would find in the building. Whatever reason, they didn't realize in that dungeon area, there were about 150 young kids from ages 3 to 14 were there because we forced to talk not to talk a word. And that was one reason we were able to manage to survive the conditions. The adults were treated brutally. And I have seen that because I sneaked up from the dungeon area to the ground floor. And I have seen how the adults were put to the wall and these thugs had guns and they could have killed them. And I'd like to tell you two particular instances what happened in a ghetto. One of them is directly affected me. The other one is a residence of the building. Every now and then in the fall, when the weather was nice, the children were allowed in small groups to play in a courtyard. And in one particular event, it could have been uh, beginning of October of 1944, we were playing around, running around, and I tripped on a rock, hit my head, and it started to bleed very badly. And my mother panicked, but I had a kindergarten teacher who taught me before. Her name is Rose. She had noticed that I, my head was bleeding and told my mother, I take care of Andy. People trying to patch up with first aid, my bleeding head. Immediately she removed the yellow star, which all Jews had to be worn in, in the country, which was declared by the Hungarian government on April 5th of 1944. That was so you were identified as it, Jews. It, if you left, if you left the building, whatever reason, everybody knew you were a Jew. And if you didn't wear a yellow star and somebody knew, then you are a Jew. You practically played with your life. To any event, Rose took the yellow star off from my outer garment and told me, Andy, you keep your mouth shut and you walk with me. And so we started to walk toward the nearest gate of the ghetto. The ghetto was completely isolated with stone walls, with the exception of four gates. When we get to the gate, the Hungarian Nazi guard yelled at her, he says, show me your ID. So she does. And then he yelled again. He said, well, you are not a Jew. You were supposed to move out of the ghetto by law. And she says, well, I lost my husband. I had no place to go. And can't you see? My son's head is bleeding, and I'm taking him to the hospital. Eventually, the guard let us out. The hospital was maybe about six, seven blocks away. When we get there, the doctors patched my head up, and then we came back. The guard outside of the ghetto wall again asked the same set of questions, but eventually let us in. Here was a lady who knew what was going on. Number one, she was a devoted Catholic, never missed a mass. She understood what was going on, and she was willing to sacrifice her life to save me. She never was married, but she understood humanity. And because of her, here I am. So this was just one instant. Then there were non-Jews who were trying to hide and protect some Jews based upon their personal uh, situation. 
The second one is, was even more significant. The Hungarian thugs came into the ghetto, could have been around Thanksgiving time, just like we are celebrating in Thursday. They came and took everybody away except the children to a collection place. And so they and take your mom away. They, they took my mother, my kindergarten teacher, and other members of the family who were living with us in our two-room apartment at that time. Did you have siblings? No, I was the only child. Oh, okay. And so anyway, they were standing there. But see, my grandmother lived in a village about six, seven miles south of the city of Budapest in, in a village close to the, the, the river banks of the Danube. In that village, practically everybody spoke a very distinct German dialogue called Schwab. Schwabia actually located in the southwest corner of Germany. It was so distinct that almost no one outside of that area could understand them. And so it was like a German, but was very corrupted. My grandmother spoke, as well as my mother spoke that uh, dialect. So they were taken away, but my grandmother noticed an SS guard. And she dashed up to him and started to speak in this strange German dialect. And as says, God said, what are you doing here? You're not a Jew. Anybody who speaks that dialect cannot be a Jew and carry the conversation. And so my grandmother said, well, my sisters and my cousins came up from the village for more protection in the city of Budapest because of the war. And they all standing in line. So the SS got passed and said, take your family, go home. It's only for the Jews. We are going to uh, administer them and ship them to concentration camps. So because of that, my grandmother saved everybody who was taken away from the building because my grandmother had no sisters and no cousins there. So there are circumstances you need to take advantage of to protect yourself. And because of that, my family from the building survived uh, the conditions uh, in, in, in the Holocaust era in a Budapest ghetto. So it, there are some lot of other stories I could possibly tell you if time would be permitted. Okay. And uh, uh, the, the Budapest ghetto was liberated in, uh, in January 17th. And, um, 1944. In 1945, and uh, what happened with my dad? That's what I was. And ask. my mother never talked about it. And I went to the village with my grandmother. Uh, I went to second grade to a Catholic school because that was the only facility existed in the village after the war. Everybody knew I am a Jew, but we kids were able to get along. It was we just were kids. Wow, right. It is it, it, anti-Semitism is born out of by hatred. And when you talk about hatred, I like to tell you, please never use that four-letter word in ever. We use it very casually every day without really knowing its meaning. See, hate caused all the evil in the past, it causes all the evil today and it would cause all the evil in the future. So replace the word hate with two other four-letter words, and you'll be surprised with which are those two, love and hope, because those words have really meaning to your life. And here are a few attributes to it. Trust, respect, care, honor, compromise, outreach, stability. And if you understand the meaning of those words, you will be a happy camper all your life. You will be smiling, you will be successful, and you will be able to manage your family and creating a home. So you need to remember what hate is and we try to eliminate it in our everyday conversation. So in any event, uh, I went to school, second grade, maybe about eight weeks. And my mother was visiting frequently. 
It was about an hour train ride from the city of Budapest. Now, the conditions were very uh, uh, li liquid at that time. The uh, Hungarians were not able to really establish any stable government. But my mother came and picked me up in end of June 1945 and said, Andy, you need to help me because I had to go to work to make a living. See, my father had a small construction business and my mother was trying to reconstitute the biz building, the business after the war. So she taught me how to cook, how to clean. And I try to just illustrate to you about cleaning. If you wanted to clean the kitchen floor, you get down on your knees, get a, a brush and a rug, and you had to heat hot water because that's the only way you were able to get hot water and clean that way. Or you wanted to cook, you needed to heat water. You had to add a, a fire in the stove. So it wasn't anything convenient, but you would think about it. We had an icebox in place of a refrigerator. We actually put ice in it. It may have lasted a day. So conditions were very bad. But in any event, before I go any further, I like to go back. When the Nazis came into Hungary in March of 1944, I have seen with my naked eye as a seven and a half year old boy how the SS marched in with a swastika armbandoner with black boots, marching in goose steps with guns. See, the swastika, if you see it, it represents two things and never forget it. Hate and killing. It doesn't matter which order. And then, going back to current times, 2017, I went home from work, turned the television on, to listening to the news, and I couldn't believe what I have seen, what I have heard. Charlottesville, Virginia, a bunch of white supremacist thugs were marching armband with a swastika on her, screaming the same slogan as I have heard as a seven-year-old who went to first grade, that to the Jews. You Jews are bloodsuckers. They don't belong to our society. It was a devastating event at that time. We have over 50 major white supremacist groups. They, and I hate to use that word hate again, hating the blacks, hating the Muslims, hating the Chinese Americans, hating the Jews. That's all what they do. They try to purif purify our wonderful country called the United States of America. So we have to be very careful. Who is our neighbor? Because you don't know. I think so, we're finding out very quickly who our neighbors are. And I recently heard a story that somebody was telling me about a group of friends, a bunch of Jewish kids in their in their 20s, and a close friend of theirs. And they found out that this person went to a rally, but it was to support what what Hamas is doing. And they were like, wait, we didn't even know this about this person. So you're so right. You don't know who your neighbors are. And it's a scary time to be Jewish here in the US. I mean, all over the world. And look at, in our situation right now, 2023, the truth is not really told. It's too much political opinions around, all over. Everybody expresses their own views without really appropriate knowledge. They didn't verify what they were really saying, and that's damaging the whole country, okay? So it's, 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 we need to really pay attention what we really do, okay? And, and uh, then going back, to the, the, the timetable of 1945. Uh, when, did you, I, when did you leave? I left Hungary in 1956. I, so obviously I went to school, public school there. 
But in a, one day in the beginning of July of 1945, the same kindergarten teacher who saved my life and helped me to overcome the difficulties as a child started to screaming top of her lungs my mother's name, Clara, Clara, Clara. So we dashed up in a corridor in a top floor of or our apartment building. And then she said, your husband, Steve, is home. I dashed down from the top floor to the ground floor faster than a rocket ever could move. I hugged the man. I was crying. It's my father. And when I took three steps back, believe it or not, I did not recognize my own dad. He was maybe 70 pounds. He looked devastating. But was my father. It took my mother over a year to nourish him back to human life. During that period of time, there were many nights when he was screaming, crying, walking up and down in our two-room apartments. And my mother told me, Eddie, Andy, leave daddy alone. He's really being what she went through in a death camp called Mauthausen, which is located in the southern part of Austria. He never talked about it because Holocaust survivors stayed away from trying to relive the horrors they went through. And I made a point to trying to promote the education for Holocaust, uh, in what happened in the Holocaust. So, it, 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 it's, it's not an easy topic to talk about, but in a public school there are just only limited amount of time available to teach really history, particularly from 1930 to 1960. Just remember, there was a Nazi occupation of the whole Europe, the Second World War, then a Soviet uh, occupation of Eastern Europe, Wait, inclu that? including Hungary, the Soviets took power in Hungary in uh, 1949. The Communist Party did win an election, and Soviet communism took hold almost immediately. See, Soviet communism, in my view, is to creating an equal standard for the people in the lowest denominator. So they pushed down and confiscated all private properties People lost identity, basically, uh, and you had to work for the government for almost nothing. So making a living was very, very hard for everybody. So, so if I have to interrupt you, and I'm sorry, because we can talk about this another hour, but we only have a few minutes left. We have about two and a half minutes left. What would you want everybody who's listening to take the biggest takeaway from what we're talking about and how you your message to them? Number one, education. Don't be a bystander, but an upstander. If you know something, hear something, see something, you must speak up. Don't be shy about it. Eliminate the word hate. Understand the word love and trust and and, and uh, uh, hope. And we must be able to speak clearly and contradict those people who are trying to falsify history. And there are too many people around here who are trying to do that. And the more education, the better we are off. Beautifully said. Andy, Andy Sarkany, how do I said your last name wrong? Because now I know how you say it. I say Sarkany. Is that okay? That's fine. Andy Sarkany. Just very quickly okay, to yes. tell you uh, a quotation uh, from John Roberts Lewis, who was a congressman for close to 30 years in uh, from Georgia. And he said that very clearly. I believe in freedom of speech. But I also believe that we have an obligation to condemn speech that is racist, bigoted, anti-Semitic, and hateful. Wow. Wow. So it is a really a very significant quotation, and we should live by it because this country is created in a manner of trying to love and, and promote uh, peace and, and, and uh, creating a prosperous life for everybody. 
Wow. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Andy. And uh, where can, we have one minute left, where can people find you? Are you on any, okay. is you, no, there an I, email? I, I purposely, I am, not, I am not on uh, any kind of a uh, social media, uh, but I can be found very easily uh, if you Google me and I can be reached uh, uh, at, at my workplace or potentially my home. Uh, I work for the Jewish Federation of Greater New Haven and my number is there as two or three. No, don't, don't leave. Okay. I'll have them look okay. for it. Okay. You can look you it can, up. You can find Andy Sarkany. Um, just Google him. And if you need more information, you can reach out to me at Jody Harrison Bauer. Thank you so much, Andy, for being on the show. This has been um, the kind of show that I wanted to have with you today. So I appreciate everything. No, and thank for, you for having me. My pleasure. And for everybody listening today, I will see you next time. In the meantime, go live your most fearlessly authentic life. Bye-bye, everyone.